cool. I'm actually just going to put a link in the chat. If anyone wants to actually download the data and, and have a look at it, then feel free. And I'll actually... Right, no Thanks. Well, hi, Augustine. Hey, Augustine. How's your new, how's your new role going, Augustine? Congratulations on uh, the new job. Thanks, thanks. It's uh, I just uh, as I just started. It's uh, still uh, you know when you just uh, drop in, it's a whole lot of information. So still <laughs> catching up with everything. Yeah. How's your new job going, Fergie? In, in my in our team, same team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think just second week for me. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, going good. Getting to know many people within the team these days. So yeah. Getting you, start, you started to... your project now, yeah? No, I haven't. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. still waiting, yeah. <laughs> ah, cool. Still doing their Go Orange. <laughs> yeah, no, I think the Go Orange was done in first week, but um, ah, okay. this week I just thought of making use of doing some trainings mm -hmm. and some certification preparation. So, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Ah, nice, nice. Yeah, because not sure once on a project you get time to do these things or not. So, just making best use of my time. Yeah, I sent you the link to the to the new e-learning platform I've got, right? Yes, yes, you did. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, let me know what you think. Yeah, definitely. And there's a, I put it up now actually. There's a financial reporting course. On there yes, yes. Yeah, I think that's so. something I'm going through. I, I think you should share here as well. We yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I said I, I will do. It. I said I just yeah. So it, I think the, the site will be live in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, so it's just. Uh, yeah, what I'm trying to do is build all of this content around financial reporting into um, into into kind of two different um, it's like into a series of modules. And the idea is that these are going to be short kind of e-learning courses, all focused around specific patterns. So you know, the idea is you know you can just look at look at the pattern and apply that to whatever you're working with, rather than it necessarily being you know a whole body of material that you need to kind of wade through everything before any of it makes sense. Whether that will work or not, I don't know. That's what we need. To, that's what I need to try. Um, but essentially, we've got I've, I've got two we've got two data sets um, that we're working with here. So we've got the simple data set, which is a series of CSV files, and that's what we'll go through today. And I put a link in the wow. chat too. Um, and then we've also got a a complex data set, which is much more around. Um, it, it's well. I mean, actually, the data is transactional data. It's scattered. It's messy data coming from, you know, um, like a, a, an accounting system. Um, and I've actually put the data into SQL Server, and then you know, put some some invoice formatted invoice data into um, into uh, blob storage. And then also we're using things like APIs to do exchange rates and things like that. So, and we're doing much more on the reporting. So there's there's kind of two two levels here and two two different things that we're looking at so um yeah we'll start with this one today and then for the other one if i can send a link to it but if you go on to my linkedin page i've got a link to a video there and actually i think i've got it in here as well just bear me a second let me just uh get the link to that youtube video so you can see what we're doing with the complex data set and some of the outputs um that we'll do for it as well just bear me a second we've still got a few people joining so maybe we'll give it a couple of minutes augustine that's yep, yeah. Cool. Yep. Uh, cool. So this is actually what I was going to present today because it's it's got the same title as this session, which is building income statement financial reporting power BI end to end. Um, but what I am going to do is actually start with a simple data set uh, and go through some of that because um, I think it's probably a little bit more manageable in the time we've got. Still some people joining, but uh... I guess we can start uh, even if some people join later, shouldn't be a problem. Um, OK, um, let's let's start the session. Uh, as always, uh, we have some uh, uh, housekeeping to do in the beginning. Um, this is a recorded meeting, um, the, the second one of the year for the Power Platform user group. Um, so if you don't consent to being recorded, um, you can also drop off, watch the uh, recording afterwards uh, on one of our channels, uh, which you can see on this slide, um, either on YouTube, the Meetup channel, or um, on LinkedIn, you'll find the link. Um, so feel free to subscribe if you don't already have subscribed. 
and um, you can you can always go back to the recordings and uh, if there's anything that you missed during the session, um, just go back and check later. Okay. Um, just quick intro to uh, for everyone who doesn't uh, know us uh, yet. Um, I'm co-hosting uh, the Power Platform User Group Stuttgart with uh, Augustine um, and uh, today uh, I have the honors of doing the intro slides and uh, you can always reach out to us after the sessions uh, at us on LinkedIn if you want. Um, as you can see, um, the LinkedIn handles are here and also uh, if you want to ask any questions afterwards, um, you can reach Augustine via his Twitter handle. For the upcoming um, sessions, um, there's, there's really some exciting stuff. So uh, we're starting the new year off uh, with exciting sessions and uh, you can see uh, quite a full agenda um, on the 26th. So uh, next week there's going to be uh, Rui Romano with Power BI Extravaganza, API Extravaganza. Then um, a week later, Pascal uh, adding a commenting Power App to Power BI. Um, of course, like we uh, already announced uh, last year, there's going to be a um, uh, yeah, a, a new um, delivery of uh, interesting um, data information, uh, the data jazz on Tuesdays. So a new format um, where there's uh, Nicola and Augustine um, presenting on different uh, topics. So um, in addition to having these sessions uh, on Wednesdays, uh, you can also um, quench your thirst for data on Tuesdays with uh, the data jazz. It's, and it's, this session for sure will continue as uh, now because it's a uh, huge interest. This will be just a slightly different format, more of a uh, conversational than the session uh, delivery. So we'll uh, pretty much combine those two and uh, data, data jazz will go just once a month, uh, every second Tuesday of the month. Cool. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, on, on the 16th uh, of February then, well, with a, a little break uh, in between, we have uh, Alexander with the Untruthful Art, five, wave, uh, five Ways of Misrepresenting Data. So uh, yeah, stay tuned. Just, and uh, Just one thing, Christian, so I am also cannot uh, update it quick enough. So we will not have a break. It will be a Scott Sewell from Microsoft uh, Customer advisory team uh, with uh, Power BI using with uh, Dataverse and uh, Dynamics 365, but I'll update the meetup. Awesome. So, so just, uh, just got a confirmation before this one, so I didn't manage to update the slides. Perfect. Wow. <laughs> Where did you so, guys find the time to do this? It's crazy. <laughs> I, I don't know. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's basically we, we started uh, with a plan that we are going once a month. Now we are once a week and yeah. things are popping in. So it's going crazy. But it's always good if there's people that, that are interested in this. So um, it's always fun if uh, lots of people connect and uh, yeah, sharing is caring. So um, that's awesome. Um, yeah, which leads me to today's session. Um, Rishi, thanks uh, to you for um, giving us a session about building an income statement in Power BI. And uh, with this, uh, I'm happily handing over to you and uh, we'll be listening in on what you can tell us. Sure. Um, so I was, I was just explaining a few things actually before whilst people were joining. So I'll, I'll go back into it. So um, just Quick introduction to myself. So, yeah, I'm Rishi. Um, I'm uh, one of the data platform MVPs um, in the community. There's a few in here in this chat actually as well. Um, so, I've, I'm a group manager at Avenard. Um, so, um, been working there for what well, is Altius before Avenard. We got acquired uh, for about five, six years. My background is actually as a, as a chartered accountant. Um, and I spent a few, quite a few years in kind of working for the big four consulting, so Deloitte, KPMG, and, and also for some of the banks and Canary Wharf, so HSBC and Barclays. Um, and then kind of moved in, at KPMG, I was doing financial modeling, and I moved into that space through kind of Power Query and Power BI came out, and, and that's where my interest really kind of flourished, and, and I moved into a more technical role um, at Altius at that point. 
Um, so I run two main communities at the moment. Um, one's called Learn Data Insights, um, uh, which is where I'm actually putting um, a course for um, some of this financial reporting. Um, and I, I had it up at the moment, actually. I'll just I'll put it up now just so you can kind of see what it's going to look like. So this is actually going to be in a few weeks. If you actually go onto the website now, it's it's not actually live. Um, it will be hopefully it, just in a couple of weeks. We're just going through some beta testing um, on it at the moment. But essentially, um, you could get a sneak preview and see uh, what this will look like. So it's going to be um, around looking at what we're looking at today. So today we're going to look at this simple data set. And there's also um, an example of some complex, a complex data set, which we've been working through the PPF school power platform finance. Sorry, right. That would help if you could, if I share my screen. Thank you. Uh, sorry, it's been a long day. Right, let me, uh, let me share my screen and then we can. Uh... Yeah. So, yeah, this is the. Um, this is this is the course. So I'd learn data insights to say this is at the moment just in, in kind of some beta testing. Um, but we've got then simple data set, which is what I put a link to in the chat, which we'll go through today. And then there's a complex data set where we're actually building out, you know, using lots of different types of data sources, including some APIs, blob storage um, and and things like that. And then also, uh, you know, we're doing some more on the reports where we're separating out the architecture into data flows and data sets, uh, looking at building using custom visuals to produce different types of income statement and paginated reports excel and then you know we're, we're, we're going through this at the moment um the other one um is the other community is called power platform finance and obviously uh, i'm bringing the two together a little bit um, and this is where we've been going through um with about 10 to 12 people i think fernando's on the call is one of them um going through a kind of syllabus for building that stuff in um, in financial reporting with Power BI, so I you know I think this is a massively underutilized area, underserved market, um, but a very very important one because it's not obvious how to work with financial data with Power BI. Um, it's not necessarily geared for that out of the box, um, and sometimes you need to use things like custom visuals or some or some DAX or you know some tricks to be able to get it to work properly. So that's kind of a bit of background and also then a bit of context to um, what we're covering today. Um, if there are questions, um, you know, feel free to um, to put them in the chat and then Augustine and uh, Christian, feel free to ask um, at any point, um, you know, happy to um, happy to take them as we go if, if people have questions as we're, as we're looking at this. So um, what we'll do, let's have a look at, let's start with have a look at the data. So um, if you downloaded that zip file, you'll see we have a few different uh, folders in here. We have monthly results, a new monthly file, and reference tables. So if we have a look at, say, monthly results, it's a folder of CSVs. And we you can see it's got monthly data, say extracts from a transaction system, uh, accounting system, going from July 2005 through to May 2008. And if we open up one of these, we will see that it's got things like some keys and then amounts. So amounts in um, local currency, because each organization here has its own currency, um, uh, reporting currency being USD, which is why we've got their reporting currency, and then they've got some local currencies for different organizations. So the amount in local currency and the amount in, in US dollars. Um, we've also then got that, so some various keys for this transaction. So each row is, is the transaction, so the date on which that transaction occurred, the organization, department key, scenario key, so this is actual or budget, account key, which relates to our chart of accounts, and then the amount. And then in that folder, there's then also a reference data um, folder, which is a single Excel file that has um, all of the, uh, the what the keys relate to. So we've got GL accounts, we've got account key, account, um, account type revenue. Um, so this is then all of our accounts. So if we see on here, account key 52, that's the top one. It relates to intercompany sales. So intercompany sales is type revenue, and there's only two types here, revenue and expenditure, because we're looking at income statement. We then have the sign um, and report sign. So what do we want to show it as on the report? So the idea is that we're using this report sign, we're showing revenue as a credit, which is positive. So we'll show it's a positive number on our income statement, and we'll show um, expenditures, a debit, as a negative number. 
So that's that helps us to kind of drive how we how we show some of this, which is which is what we want. Um, we then have the categorization of this account. So in, in any accounting, you know, everything's booked to an account, a chart of accounts. So this is your chart of accounts. Everything is booked to a particular GL account, general ledger account, and then we have that categorization. So it's categorized as revenue, and underneath that is categorized as returns and adjustments, and, and there's no categories underneath that. But if we look at, say, salaries, at the lowest level, it's categorized as a heading called salaries, and then we've got a subheader of labor expenses, and then that goes up. That's a type of operated expenses. So these are some of the things that we will actually show in the income statement. So this header assignment and then we'll drill down into be able to drill down from cost of sales and then look at all the different cost of sales. We'll show operated expenses and allow us to drill down into there. So that's that's that. And then we've got the subheaded detail here in terms of do we need to go down into any are there any further details that we need to go into? So this is for what's called a ragged hierarchy where we can drill down from one level and then drill down into the next. But there'll be some lines where we, we don't need to do that for. Um, we're not actually going to use that at the moment, um, but it is a useful thing to have. We then have all the other keys and things that relate to it. So date table. So uh, yep, standard calendar table. Um, most of you I imagine will be will be quite familiar with that. So no need to really go into that. It's just it works exactly like any other dimension. We've got date key in our uh, transactions and that relates to here and then all the attributes of the date. Department key. So again, we've just tagged each transaction against the department. Um, and then we've got organization. So we've tagged each transaction against an organization. Um, and we do have um, a bit of a hierarchy in here. Again, we're not really going into the hierarchy, but the fact is it's, it, it's quite useful to have it like this, where we have the parent, because then you can actually drill down from USA operations into those um, or, you know, drill down even further. Um, and actually, we, there's, there's parents of parents here because uh, one of these parents will be um, an actual division. And then we have scenarios. Oh, sorry, the main thing to bring out as organizations actually is that to say we've got different different currencies. And again, we're not this in a simple example, we're not necessarily going into that detail, but um useful to know that those are those are then we've already got the amounts already converted to us in reporting currency. Um, but essentially, and that's all we're going to report on in this data set, but we do have the ability to look at it in local currency as well. And then we've got scenarios, and there's only two scenarios, actual and um, budget. So um, that's our data that relates to the keys. Um, and then the last folder on there was just um, a new monthly file. So essentially, if we bring in new data, we can um, connect, bring that in and it will automatically refresh and it, it will potentially show that as we go through. Uh, any questions before we start? OK, so um, what we'll do now is just open up Power BI Desktop and we're going to start to ingest that data. So um, actually, I'm just thinking I, I was going to actually just put this in for my folder, but I'm, you know, as one of the challenges of doing that, we can connect a folder and we can actually before I before I do that, so I actually just wanted to show I just wanted to show actually this process in Excel a little bit um, just to kind of highlight why we might want to use Power BI for some of this. So um, let me just uh, just bear me a second. Let me just bring up the. Um, uh, sorry, this is missing. Sorry, this folder is missing the actual um, template. Just bear me one second. Yep. So if we go into here, and I've uploaded this just to Teams, and this is actually where we're going to bring in all of our data from. So if we now look at some income statements, an example of how we might do this in um, Excel. Let's just let's just have a look at, at that process. So if we were using this data, so the first thing we'd have to do actually is bring in use a macro or something to consolidate all of our data into a single table. So we'd probably have to run a macro to combine it all. So we have all of the data in a uh, single one. And here we're actually doing an income statement month by month. So we actually don't need to do that. Or we'll, here we're actually going to use different references, um, and which you might need to do because if your data is quite large, especially you might want to have an income statement month by month and then to link into other Excel files for each month. So here we brought in all the data from our transaction table. And again, we might want to automate that. And then we've got the reference data. So we brought that all into the same workbook. Again, you could do external links, but you start to get a bit messy. And then we do some lookups um, to bring in all of the actual 
details. So what's the organization name, what's the GL account, all of the details that we need for those. We then um, can go in and we've got all, our, all of our data there. So we brought in all of the tabs um, and you know, we've got this now for a particular month. And then we can come up with our income statement here. So this is just a format of the income statement as well. It's quite useful to look at how we're going to do this. So we start with revenue. Um, we have some discounts in there. So then we have net sales, uh, which is gross sales, less discounts. And then we have cost of sales. And then we have our gross margin, which is our revenue, uh, less our cost of sales. This is a negative number. So we can plus it. We then have operating expenses. And we have those all broken down here. And then we have operating profit other income expenses, um, taxes, and then net income at the end. So this is the kind of format of the income step we want. And you know there are some advantages of doing this with Excel because actually it's really nice in terms of the formatting. We can format it exactly how we want. We have our spaces in between here. Um, you know we can we can format these numbers how we want with different currencies. Um, but then to get the numbers, we have to start doing some sum ifs formulas to start to bring them in. So we say look at the combined data where it's actual and then um, you know multiply it by um, the, the, the sign. This is the report sign that we want to bring in. So multiply it by one or minus one. So we start to do some of these formulas in here and then we want to go to the prior month. And now our data is in a separate Excel file. So we need to go in and, um, and, and connect to that and then do some calculations in here. And if our data is quite voluminous, this is this is going to be a very onerous task and very error prone because, you know, lots of things with with, with formulas and stuff in there. But we have some of the flexibility around the you know, ease of calculation with looking at cells. But then we get the challenge of saying, OK, well, number one, you know, then we also need to tell us, you know, understand what's driving these numbers. Uh, a, a table of data is great as an income statement, but actually we want to do some analysis. We want to understand, you know, what are what are, what's driving our variances um, and, you know, maybe go down to another level of detail or look at individual transactions. And, you know, this is where it becomes quite hard because actually we need to go back and, and start to apply some filters and maybe copy stuff into another sheet. We then say, OK, we want to now distribute this income statement to different divisions, different departments, so they can only see their own data. And then we have to have a macro potentially to go in and you know create different copies of the Excel file with different cuts of the data and do all of that. And you know these are typical finance processes, which you know you're paying qualified accountants to do every single month. Probably a lot of organisations pay you know qualified accountants to do this uh, you know every single month for you know even even sometimes more frequently than that to close the books. I used to be working product control. And it was, you know, similar process. It was we 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 had our front end and back end transactions coming in from um, in, into an access database or be loaded into an access database by the India team. They were coming in the morning, and this would be connected to access and bring in the data and, and create our PLs in there. And this was daily. So yeah, there's there's lots of arduous finance processes, um, all based around Excel. And you know, whilst it's great that you have the flexibility and agility of it, you know that that manual work, that error prone, you know, you know the difficulty of working with large data volumes, all of those things, and, and the inability to really have that that granularity, the logic and calculations of that granularity, um, you know. It's, you, it's, there's a difference between doing things in Excel row by row and summing them up versus doing a measure in Power BI, which can actually look at your gross margin percentage broken down by different divisions and areas and things like that, which you can't really do with Excel unless you start to use things like pivot formulas and things like that, which are uh, an absolute nightmare if anyone's tried to use them. So I just want to start with a little bit of a use case as to why we want to um, do that in, um, in, in Excel, sorry, in, in, in Power BI. As opposed to potentially um, the solutions that we see in a lot of organizations where it's, it's all Excel based. Um, and actually, once you have a data model in Excel, sorry, Power BI, you can use that as a back end. Um, so, you ask this question why is the ownership column showing? Where is the ownership column? Oh, um, in the organizations table. Uh, it's to do with when you do balance sheet consolidation. So, um, you, if you own only part of a company, you only present um, that proportion in your balance sheet and the rest is minority interest. Um, again, we're not getting into that. I mean, these, these are actually interesting. Um, so the, the, the company owns 75% of it, 25% is owned by someone else. That's that's what that equates to. But it's, it's, I forgot that some of these bills are in this status actually, because we're not we're not using them here. Um, these are all, all use cases we could bring up though, if we want to, when we want to extend on it. So um, 
you go to get data. So let's let's now have a look at how we do this in Power BI. So obviously, one of the advantages of Power BI is we don't need to use macros to consolidate all the data. We can just connect it to a folder and um, bring in all of the data. And actually, what I wanted to do was actually show um, how we might connect the data in a different way. So if we uh, I don't think I'm actually going to go and run through this all here because actually this is a little bit. Um, so if we go to um, Teams, PPF School, and we'll see in here we've got um, and we've got some data, and here is actually this is actually our data in here, our monthly results. So what we can do if we want to connect to this data, so that we, this is just you know saved on a OneDrive location. The challenge with us just connect, me just connecting to my local machine is that I've got to then refresh it using a personal gateway. Um, if someone else opens it on their machine, then they won't have the same data. So actually having it in a OneDrive location, a cloud location, really makes a lot of sense. So if we go into here, open in SharePoint, what we can do is actually use the SharePoint connector behind OneDrive to connect to this. So if I do this now and um, actually just connect to, um, I think it's, is it the share documents level or is it the level below? So let's just do SharePoint folder. This is going to be a slightly slower connection. So I think what I might do is actually, I think this is without the share documents. What I might do is actually not connect to this at the moment. I'll connect to it on my machine just for speed purposes. But this is a better way to connect to it because you're much better off really, you know, what I think should be the option when you when you click, I want to connect to Excel or CSV, it should say, well, where's your data stored? Is it on the cloud? Is it OneDrive or is it on your machine? And, you know, prompt you more towards the cloud because it's it's much more, much more maintainable. Um, let me just see if this if this is slow, then I will just um, connect to it from my machine just for just for speed purposes. But essentially, this is how we can then bring in all of that data. Okay, so you click on transport data. Don't click on combine automatically, especially because this has got so much other data in there. It's, it's at the root level. So here, if we just go back to Teams and let's just see. So it's under. We want to do simple transaction files and then data. So we can then now filter for a folder. because we don't want to bring in everything across our shared documents folder. Um, these are all the different folders we've got. And unhelpfully, it's not really showing um, exactly where we want to connect to. So Let me just extend that a little bit so we can. Yeah, it's a little bit annoying because we've got such long paths. <laughs> to just see which one it's actually connecting to. So actually, let me just do this. Uh, yeah, this is what we want actually. Let's change that. So now this should give us all of our data. So here we set this up as a staging query. So it's it's really good practice to have a query that just has your connection to your data. And this is. Um, and then we don't need to enable load on it, so we disable load and now we reference that. So this query just contains our connection to our data. It doesn't do any transformations or anything like that. We have another query that references it that starts to do the transformations and things like that. So if our data source changes and we can parameterize this as well. So actually we could go into here, replace this with a parameter. It's all things to just make our, our, our Power Query a little bit more maintainable. Um, and even the path we can parameterize um, and then you know, have that as a, as a single source for our, for our data. So now we're referencing that here. We've got all of that. We can do remove other columns and we can combine the data this way. And hopefully this this isn't going to take too long. I know sometimes SharePoint can be a little bit slow. OK, 
Okay, so now it's asking us how do we want to combine the files? So it takes the first file as a sample, um, delivered to a comma, and um, we, the data type detection. So the only reason you might want to change this is if you've got some blanks, for example, in the first few 200 rows, and you, you know that there's numbers coming on later files, then you might want to change that, but this is absolutely fine. It will pick those up correctly. So what it's done then as the combine is it's created um, created a function for us and a parameter as a sample file. We don't need to really worry about these, but if we wanted to apply other transformations, so for example, if each of your CSVs had a header at the top, you could actually just go in and say, when you transform the file, actually just remove my headers at the top, um, remove the top end rows. So you know you could do that in an example file, then just copy and paste it here and it'll do it as part of the function. So there's, there's some advantages of being able to tweak some of these, uh, but you use them as a starting point. But now it's what it's done is given us all of our um, all of our data and it's actually given us um, the right kind of data types for these as well. So now this is our um, uh, finance data. Yep. so this is our uh, actually, actually this is our kind of uh, our, our general ledger, if you like, or uh, our trial balancing. We can we can if we if we do this by month, maybe we can group it up. So we've got our finance data there. So now um, we want to do the same thing for the Excel work, but can actually if we, our Excel workbook is actually on SharePoint as well, so we can actually then use the same staging query but reference it, and maybe we did actually maybe we needed our staging query to be a level below because it's actually not in exactly the same folder. Again, just to speed now, I am just going to connect to the one on my on my desktop, but um, just bear in mind um, that um, the other one is the, the approach of putting it onto um, uh, OneDrive or SharePoint, so then using the SharePoint connector is, is a much better approach. So just bear me a second. So if I go back now into desktop and LDI financial reporting data set, we've got the reference data there. So it's given us two sets of, um, of tables here. One is these are formatted as tables in Excel and these are worksheets. Because we formatted the data as Excel as a table, which is always advisable, let's just pick those out because, you know, if it's got stray cells and things like that, it, it won't pick them up. It's, it's actually just a table that's all um, the data that's all together. So it's, it's much better to use tables in Excel. So now we have all of that data. Now we can put it in. So it's been a second. Um, and now we have all of our dimensions and let's just organize these a little bit. So let's just move to group. And we'll call these dimensions. And um, let's just move this to a group called staging. Those other ones are staging as well. And then this is our fact table. This is our, our central table with our transaction. It's a good idea just to organize your queries in this way as well. So we have our, our dimensions, and I don't think we really need to do anything with those. Those should all come in as well, um, and our finance data. Now, one table I didn't go through, we were looking at the reference data, is actually really key, and I'm actually just going to have a look at it now, just so we can, now we've got a bit of an idea of the context of the data. It's this table called headers. Now, what this is, is it's a metadata table. It's a helper table, if you like, on how we want to lay out our income statement. Now, for some of the examples, and actually, you know, quite a few here, this is this might be sufficient, right, for most of the rows, right, because we've got revenue, we can drill down into gross sales and then into, into subheader two. We can go from header assignment to subheader to subheader two. But actually, our income statement contains other things. So it contains, whilst it contains the line revenue and that, that relates to where our GL account is revenue, it also creates, for example, a net sales line or a gross margin line. Now, this is a calculation. There's no GL accounts which relate to gross margin because it's actually all of the GL accounts which relate to revenue, less all of the accounts which relate to cost of sales. So if we want to show this on our income statement, we, we're not able, we need somewhere to have that data point that says, cost of sales, gross, gross margin, for example, and we don't have that anywhere in our chart of accounts. So what's useful to have here then is a metadata table where we can put this on our rows um, of our income statement. Um, and also what's useful is, is then this order number because we want the income statement to appear in a particular order, um, whereas if we do it from here, it'll just be alphabetical as well. So for those headers, 
which do relate to our chart of accounts. Those are cal what we've said here as calc type one. So calc type one means we can actually create a relationship between this table and our GL accounts on header assignment, and it will go and pick it up. And it says revenue, yep, I'll give you all the accounts and I'll give you, you know, link that into the fact table. And yep, here you go. These are all, all the accounts that relate to revenue. This is the total of those. All the accounts that relate to cost of sales, total of those. Operating expenses, total of those. And then where we've got calc type two, we're saying actually um, it's not, there's, there's no there's no line for it in GL accounts, but we're going to create a custom calculation. In this case, calc type two is actually a running total. It's a cumulative total. We're saying revenue and then um, all the ones that come under revenue is net sales. Um, and then under here, gross margin, it's revenue and cost of sales. So it's it's just a cumulative total operating profit, revenue, cost of sales, operating um, expenses for net income. So that's why these are actually running totals. We can also have custom calculations. So you can have calc type three and you can say, if you're cal look at if it's calc type three, look at what you've got here. If it's gross margin, do this measure. Otherwise, do this measure. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Do we start to use it whilst the state is loading? No questions. Everyone's everybody shy today. Rishi, just uh, just a quick question. In, sure. in the meantime, the yep. yeah, in the meantime, data is loading. So uh, I just liked your trick about you know keeping the connection in the data set and then disabling its load, so it just doesn't load to Power BI. Yep. But I have a question there. Like, still that data set is there, creating a connection to your SharePoint, right? So does it take that extra memory in Power BI, or it doesn't? No, no, no not at all. So essentially, when you reference a query, yeah. Um, so when we have here as a referenced query, all, mm -hmm. all the en engine actually does when it evaluates it. I oh, sorry, this is not a referenced query. Uh, where were we? Finance data. Yeah. So this is referenced query. All it does is replace this and actually just you know copy and paste the M code from that yes. above here. So it just yes. does it all in one go. So it's not mm -hmm. it's 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 not add, adding that extra overhead essentially. By yeah, reference. yeah, but but is the staging one adding anything extra to Power BI? No, because not, it has got connected. your original connection, right? It has got the actual connection. Not that I know of. I don't think it's adding anything. Okay. It's it's it, whether you do it in one query or reference queries. I don't think it makes any real difference. In any difference. Okay. To the, okay. To the speed or memory usage or things like that. Shouldn't. Okay. Maybe maybe there's stuff behind the scenes that means it does, and and you need someone like Chris Webb to to tell you how. Why no, no, but I, but I think that makes uh, sense. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. Okay, so um. Let's just have a look at the data model. So now it's created a lot of those relationships automatically because the keys were the same. So scenario key links into scenario key, um, dim accounts limbs into dim accounts. And you, you can see why this is a much better structure than having to do it in Excel and bring all the tables into one big, a huge view. So organizations on their dates key and the one that hasn't picked up or done automatically is dim headers because actually we've named it differently. And this is where we're actually going to do to, you know, we deviate a little bit from a star schema and we're actually going to do it as a um, snowflake. So essentially we're going to link in our um, dim headers, our, our header in there, uh, I think it's called header, into header assignment, it's called here. So this is then a, a one to many on there because our headers only appear once. Um, if we if we wanted to have different versions of our income statement here, then potentially that would be a a many to many join there, or you know we could we could we could try and manage that. But essentially that's um that's what we've got there, and then that goes from there into our accounts into our finance data. So now we've got our relationships all set up. Um, so one thing we need to do first then is actually um now let's create rather than for, for ease of reference and we can we can do this either as a measure or as a calculator column i'm just going to do it as a calculator column um in here in dax it's a little bit more transparent in our finance data we have amount usd um but we also just want to actually we might as well what these are all coming in as as um as whatever sign they're coming in as actually we want to multiply them by assuming they're all coming in as positive i thought actually but Let's assume for purposes they are, they're all coming this positive. And then we want to add a column that's going to give us that times the sign. So it's going to give it to us in the right sign. So this is amount um, sign equals 
amount USD times, and we can use the related function here to say, look at our DIM accounts and look at the report sign there. And then that gives us the amount multiplied by the sign. So now um, these are all positive numbers. Uh, these are all coming in as, um, as credits, uh, revenue accounts, presumably, um, but we should see some here that also then have the sign um, reversed um, as we get down to expenditures. So now we've got that, and now we can create some kind of base measures. Um, so we could create them in a separate table if we want to have a separate measures table, and that is sometimes good practice. But again, for here, I'm just going to create it in the fact table. So now if we have one called um, total amount, and this is just going to be our sum of um, finance data, amount USD was signed. Now we could have actually just done amount USD and then just done um, done it in here, sum X, and then times it by related. That would have been exactly the same thing. Same thing as the calculator column. I've just done it here for uh, a little bit more transparency around what we're doing. Just you know, if people are looking at it, it makes it a bit easier to see. Um, OK, so now we've got um, a total amount there. So now let's create some slices on our page. So let's we've got a date table so we can go to dim dates and we could drag on um, if we want to say our year. Um, and we could do, and actually let's drag on our uh, year and month. Let's drag on to the same hierarchy slicer. So now we've actually got them. Um, we can look at these for a given a given month. So we've got them like in a nice hierarchy like that. Um, so now we can look at the income statement for, uh, for any period. And um, we'll see actually this data is only going up to um, May 2008. I think actually if we wanted to, yep, one of the things I have shown in this demo before is actually if we bring in the new file into June and then just do refresh, we start to see June and it, and it refreshes here. Um, also, just a quick thing here, usually your date table actually goes out to a much longer period than you have data for. So one of the things you can do is create a visual level filter. So here where we've got total, we want to filter our date range to only dates that we have data for. So what we can do is drag on total amount into filter that is visual and say it's not blank. And that will then restrict it to, um, to we've got it. So that's already done in this case. Um, not, not sure exactly why I think it's just the data set was the date range was already set that way, but generally your date table would go up for a longer period. So um, we have that now and now um, now we can start to create our matrix and we can just have a look at it. And um, if we go on to here and we can drag on, um, so do a matrix, can drag on total amount in values. And then from our on our matrix headers, we put in the header, which is the first one. And you'll see it's actually sorting it alphabetically, which is not particularly useful. So we need to go to the header, sort by column, sort by order. So now, because if you remember on our head on our dem headers table, we had um, an order number here. So now we've sorted that. And hopefully now when we sort this, we can see our numbers coming up right. Um, and we can we can do a few different variations of this. We can just have total amount. We'll keep it as that for now. Now you'll notice that this, by default, is only showing those that we have that were calc type one that were linking back into our chart of accounts. And actually, we want to show all of them. And just to the the reason is obviously is because it's looking back here and it's saying, right, gross margin. Give me. Let me join that back onto DIM accounts where it's gross margin and then back onto finance data. Now there's nothing in here, so this just returns blank and there's nothing there to give you um, transactions for. There's no account keys. So they are there, but they're just showing us blank. So if we actually did this, show items with no data, you'll see them come up. Um, but they obviously they're blank because there's no GL accounts against them. But at least we can see them. That's, um, that's fine. Now this total amount measure actually makes absolutely no sense at all because it's just summing together you know data obviously for multiple periods and, and maybe ultimate, ultimate organizations as well but it's also summing actual and budget data which which makes no sense so let's um let's start to build on our measures and start to make some more meaningful measures so now we want to create a measure that's called total actuals and we'll create a few a few measures so we'll do 
calculate. So we now you can use calculate to change the filter context. So we can say give us a measure, but actually for a particular value from one of the other tables that we've got. So now if we do total amount, and then we can say give me total amount, but where my value in the dim scenarios table equals actual. I don't remember when I call it actual or actuals. We'll find out. And drag it into here. Yep, it's actual. So we can see now here we've got our, our actuals. Um, and let's also just create. Now we can build build on these as measure chains. So now we want to do say our actuals last year. And now we want to you know build up like we had in Excel that income statement. So again, we because we've got a calendar table, this is really easy because we can say actually just take our total actuals, but give it to me for the same period last year. So whatever context we're looking at, if we're looking at the whole of 2008, it will give it to you for the whole of 2007. If we're looking at March 2008, it will give it to you just for March 2007. So whatever your context is, go back a year and, and give me the equivalent. And here all we need to pass in is the fact that our date take key. We've got a date table, makes that very easy. Now let's just drag that on to see if that actually works and it doesn't. Does anyone know why? Does anyone know why that's giving me blank? Something to do with our date table? I think we have to mark it as a date table. Now you don't always need to do this and I'm not sure exactly what conditions it means you do it, but it's a good practice to do it anyway. So now we mark that as a date table. We tell Power BI as a date table, and then it it could pass it. It could use it in the same period last year, um, and it knows it's a date table. So then it it knows how to how to reference those columns in there. Um, I think it's probably to do with the fact that we're joining on date key, um, so it doesn't it doesn't pick it up as a date table automatically. So now we've got our actuals and our actuals prior year. So 2008, 2007. Um, and now we can do, again, we could build on this a bit more. We can do variance to prior year. Right, so now we can do um, total actuals, less actuals prior year. And again, now we're, we're just building up this kind of measure chain. Um, so chains of measures, you know, that they just refer to other measures. And again, there's no real performance impact of this. It can, it can obviously make your model a little bit harder to kind of audit and, and go through as people are going through different measures. So, you know, you want to have a base set of measures and you want to have, you know, things that make sense, whereas where that traceability is, is easy. Um, and we can have another one here, for example, um, actuals um, variance percentage. And we can just divide our actual uh, variance to prior year. I should call it actuals variance to prior year um, divided by actuals prior year. And this one, we have put it in the wrong table, but never mind. Um, here we can actually um, put this as a percentage. And what's useful now is that actually we can start to use these numbers, these variances. And again, this is this would be, you know, very much harder to do in Excel um, in this kind of way. But we can use this variance percentage and start to look at, you know, how our variances break down by individual row. So we can start to understand what's really driving the numbers here. Because if we look at our accounts, for example, and we put in, say, subheader in here, kind of put it, say, as a bar chart, um, and actually let's filter it for a particular type. So um, account type. And let's look at just expenditures. And let's put in here um, some data labels. We can start to see actually, you know, where where are what, what's been our biggest increase in expenditures overall. Um, and we can start to then you know cross filter. So even if we looked at an operate, I just want to focus on the operating expenses. And if we cross highlight that, um, we can start to really drive a story. So actually, just having the income statement is is great. And you you know you do need a uh, an income statement, but actually having it combined with charts where you can start to really see um, what's driving the variances is is really useful um, to be able to understand you know what what that data means to tell a story with that data. So back to our income statement, um, we can see here that we've got our numbers, but 
also these formatting is not great and one of the reasons that excel is so loved is because actually you've got so much control over the custom format but actually with power bi you can actually um, use those same custom number format strings in uh, in power bi so um so you don't want to select all your measures in different folders so what i'm going to do is just copy and paste in a format string from excel so i've gone into now for some reason that feature is in the modeling view but anyway um select format go to custom and here you can enter a format string so i'm just going to enter in one from it that I copied from excel actually but it shows positive numbers with a pound sign and um that's just usd wasn't it but anyway um it shows it with a pound sign and then we've got uh, with a comma um and then it shows negative numbers and brackets and blanks um in that in that way as well so that's what the, that's what those represent and now we can see we've got our numbers there um formatted with currencies and, and actually looks a lot better so we can see negative numbers in the right way and i think we've done something wrong there actually because that sh those should be negative numbers um let me just uh maybe i'm supposed to use um sign rather than report sign on this so it's been a little while since i've used this data let me just go back to my calculator column also rishi can you make that matrix visual a little bigger it's hard to hard to see yeah, those numbers. Sure. thank you thank you so much Yep, so sign, not report sign. Do you want it there? I'm not sure why I've got both. Uh, let me actually just make this a bit smaller and actually let me increase the font size of this as well. So, is that better? Yep, thank you. Yeah, cool. Okay, so now we've got. Um, We've got some things now we've got our numbers that we can show you know total amount uh, we don't need total amount anymore actually that was just a base measure so now we've got our actuals and actuals prior year um now one of the things we also might want to do is actually show um month to date quarter to date year to date um and i'm just slightly conscious of time because there's a few ways you can do this so one of the ways i actually wanted to show is uh, calculation groups because one of the things we want to be able to do is have a slicer selection to say, I want to view my month my, for any given month. And actually this this might be a good one to do if we, if we have a kind of single selection for month here. We can say, I want to view monthly numbers. I want to view quarterly. I want to view yearly. Um, and we want to be able to have that calculated dynamically. So um, what we can do, and I'll just talk through the process and then I'll show you in, in another example of using something similar. We'll create an enter data. And we can create some values here, month to date, quarter to date, and year to date. And then what we can do is put that as a slicer, a disconnected table. So we don't connect it to anything because it's nothing that it connects to anyway. And then um, what we can do is um, say, look at what's selected. If it's month to date, then do this measure. If it's quarter to date, do this measure. Otherwise, do this measure. And then we, we have that as our actuals rather than um, just the sum of the amount we sign. So um, let me let me show you another example. And if we've got time, I'll come back to that. And then the other way of doing that, rather than using a enter data table, is to use calculation groups, which does the same thing. It actually creates a measure behind each row of a table, essentially. So it creates like an enter data table and then creates a measure behind it. So we could do that one of two ways, and I'll come back to that um, if I did. I wanted to just get on to actually showing how to build out the income statement. So um, now, it does, as I said, we don't have the subtotals in here yet and, and the running totals. So what we can do is we can create um, a measure that's going to be a cumulative total on our headers table. So let's just look at this here. So we, this is for our calc type twos. So what we want to do is say when it's operating profit, take all of the calc type ones essentially um that are have an order number less than this order number so anything that's less than six so one to five take all of those lines and that gives you operating profit and now actually it's the same for all the calc type twos here for net income we want to take all of the all of the ones um uh, underneath this um because they're all the, the all the lines so we want to do revenue cost of sales um operating expenses and other income and expenses and that will give you a net income 
So we can just deploy a pattern for that. That's calc type two uh, for running total. So what I'm going to do is just do a new measure here. And I'm going to call this um, total amount running total. Now, um, we can have a look on DAX patterns or something like that, and it will give you the pattern for cumulative total. Um, and it can be used for anything. It's obviously most commonly used for dates, but here we're going to use it on our number. The first thing we want to do is say, what's our current order, header order? And here we could use selected value or max because on the matrix, there's only ever going to be one value selected because you're only going, this is the first level of your matrix. So for each row on your matrix, there's only going to be one of these because by necessity, that's what you've put as your top level. But here we're going to use max because if you didn't have anything selected by default, it will give you the income, which is not a bad thing to show as a, as a, as a money total as your net profit. So here we do max um, dim headers. We just define that as a variable and then we can with reference that. So now we can do return, calculate, and we can calculate our total actuals and say, give it to me for where our dim headers order is less than our current header order. Um, and I don't think this will work. Can anyone spot something I might have done wrong in this formula? Let's drag it on and see what it does. Unless it's got a little bit more clever. Since the last time I do it, it does seem to get clever every month, so it's completely possible. Nope, it's given us blanks. Could anyone think of what I might need to do to, to change this? OK, oh, OK, but now we can, we can look at it. So essentially, the challenge with this is each time it's evaluating it, it's evaluating this current header order as one, two, three, four, five. And then it's saying, give me total actuals where dim headers order, and this has been evaluated in, in the same context. Um, so each time it's going through each row, it's saying dim headers order one is less than one, two is less than two, three is less than three. And obviously that's just going to return you blank. So what we need to do is put a remove filters or an all condition in there to say, um, look across the whole headers table. You know, don't just focus on the one row. In at the moment, uh, consider the whole table when collation. And hopefully now we can see we've got a, uh, a running total there. So 43, um, 43, and then it takes off the 14, um, and you get to 29, I think. Yep, take off the 21, and you get to 7.8, and so on, and you get to the same net profit number at the end. Um, so now what we need to do is then just have a measure. We don't need a running total on here. We just want a single measure that's going to show us both. So now we can do So here we can say, look at again what you've got selected in context <coughs> on your matrix. Um, even though we haven't selected it in a slicer per se or selected, it's it's the kind of, we could use selected value because again, we're only gonna really have one in scope here. So dim headers, calc type. And now we can say, look at our calc type. If it's one, then actually let's just show um, our total actuals. Um, let's just do total amount. Uh, and I'll show you why. We'll do total amount. This is a really important, actually. I'll, I'll come back to this. So we want to do our total amount, our base measure, not at. And now we want to do, um, if it's two, we want to do total amount running total. And I think if I didn't use amount in there, I used actuals in there, then I need to change that. So yeah, otherwise we can return blank. So this is now going to return our total amount, a sum of amount USD. Um, which is which is fine. And then this is then going to say total amount running total and then blank. Now let me just check that measure. We just wrote the running total one. And yep, I actually want to do this as total amount. Come back to Y. So 
at the moment, if we just dragged on this income statement amount, um, it, this is this is not actuals or budget or anything. It's just income statement amounts. It's not going to give us the right numbers because this is summing actuals and budget and things like this. But the reason I wanted to do it this way is because now we've created a new base measure. So essentially, where we're referencing, rather than creating a whole series of measures now for every single one to say total amount actuals, income statement amount actuals, and look at this and look at this and look at month to date, prior to date, year, uh, month to date, quarter to date, year to date, plus look at the running total, all of that. Actually, what we could do is just create a new base measure. So now we can do uh, go back to our total actuals and replace total amounts with total income statement amounts. And when we do our budget, we can do the same thing. So now our total actuals already is now giving us the right results. And actually, that's what we need. And same with the prior year calculation. We haven't needed to change anything there because it's taking this as a base measure. So think about what level you want to apply your base measures at, I guess is the point there. Um, by doing this actually in our income statement amount um, measure and using that as a new base measure for our actual total budget and then building our measures on top of there, it, it's a much neater solution than, than trying to create different variations of it. So that's our um, that's essentially our income statement. We can go a lot further with that. As I say, we can have different versions of the income statement. We can have um, we, we can actually have in our dim headers table here. We could actually have maybe another column that says, you know, income statement type one, type two, type three, and then it has different lines. So you can have dynamic income statements and then select the right one you want to show. Say we can have one for custom calculations. So this might be gross, actual gross margin actually really refers to the percentage. So you might actually say gross margin percentage, and then it's a calc type three. And then we have in our switch statement here, when we have total income statement amount, we say if it's type three, then do a measure that's say custom calculation. We haven't created that. And then our custom calculation measure will be a very similar one to here to say, look at the name of the custom calculation. If it's gross margin percentage, use this measure. If it's something else, use this measure. And that way we can have different types of data in our income statement. We can have numbers and then percentages. Um, you could even have in here, you could actually have blank lines. As long as it's got the, the order number right, it will show a blank line. Um, we need to be a little bit careful with that because there's a few things that, that change on that. but Essentially, yeah, we can we could use a helper table, a metadata table to be able to drive the format that we want um, of things like an income statement. And obviously this can be applied to other scenarios as well. Any kind of questions on that? So yeah, I appreciate we've come right up against the clock. And I'm happy to show you the month yes, Rishi. here today. Um, if we want to as well. Uh, Rishi, one question. Yep. Uh, I, I really liked it. Uh, do you ever tried like consolidation rules on the on the um, those calculations as well? Like, uh, for instance, for consolidated cogs, where you take out the intercompanies. Ah, when you take out intercompanies, I was um, yeah, it's definitely possible. I mean, um, you typically define it in your kind of logic for. Uh, you, know, you could do it. You could do it in a few ways. You could do it as custom calculation there, right? So you could have it as a measure where you could say. Um, so you know, here if we rather than defining it as a just linking straight into the into the GL accounts, you know, you could have this one as a as a custom calculation, right? Um, uh -huh. Custom. Yep. So now you would do calculate um, income statement amount. Um, income statement amount, but actually for where um, the uh, G dim dim accounts. Uh, account type equals revenue less the inc calculate where the it equals to income statement yeah. uh, equals into company and then this total revenue custom okay. you'd have as calc type three as a custom calculation that would say look at what your name is of your custom calculation if it's total revenue custom and obviously you need to put that in here yep so you need to you'd have that then as your um your, your revenue line you'd maybe call it something slightly different so it doesn't just create a relationship automatically for you. OK. We'll do it as Thank just, you very much. Do it as Cal type three, yep. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, you, I forgot. I didn't see you guys answered. No, I filter context question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I missed it. Yep. Rishi, I have a question. You tables, yep. Hey, uh, 
thanks for the presentation. I really like the format string. Um, how do you how do you uh, format the how do you get the dates in the correct order? Because I tried doing it the other day, you know, with the month, the order order month by month number. Um, uh, you really that, need please? in your date table um, one of the one of the columns that's really important to have there is um, year month number sort year month number sort. And I say that and I don't think I've got it in this table because I've used I've used an example date table. But essentially you have your year month, for example, and then year month sort. Um, or you can actually and in this case, we're sorting the date um, and we're sorting the date by a date key. So an integer value that you can sort by. You can sort at different levels. Right. So you can sort the month by month number, the date by date key. Um, so I think this is already kind of sorted by that. Um, but that will get your that will get the order right essentially yeah okay what, so once you. you've got the order there then that will that will appear in the right order there so you, you need it basically the short answer is you need an integer value for whatever you want to sort by so in most date tables you'll have year and then you'll have year month number so it'll be 2006 12 2006 11 and then it will you can sort your year month by date key uh, year month number Cool. Uh, and Fernando, yeah, the space data set to use with other systems. Yep, Info River. Yep, analyze in Excel. Exactly. Um, if, uh, yeah, if I had time, I'd like to show it actually, because once we create this model, you can actually use analyze in Excel and we can create the income statement, you know, that exactly in the format we want, but without any data in the Excel workbook. It just connects live to the to the to the Power BI workbook on the Power BI service. So all your data is there, all your security is there. So if I try to open up the Excel workbook and I didn't have underlying permissions on the data set, I wouldn't be able to see the data. And you know, you've got none. So none of the security issues, none of the multiple versions of the truth, none of the issues of working with large data volumes in Excel, none of the calculation, all your calculations, you can reuse all of your measures, all of that. So I actually really like that approach of using Power BI as a data set and then essentially analyze in Excel or format of analyze in Excel to um, then create the income statement or anything else that we want um, in Excel as a, as a basis. Use Excel as a front end tool, basically. And, and even if you don't want to use Power BI as a front end tool, if you want to, if you if you really want that control over your customization, um, what Fernando is referring to is some tools that some custom visuals that also provide a much better front end. Um, so I'll show you a couple of visuals on here. Um, we've got the one that he was talking about is InfoRiff, and I don't know if that's on App Source actually. I don't I think it is yet. Uh, maybe InfoRiver Professional, yeah, the professional version's there. This actually brings like an Excel style ribbon into your visual so you can really control cell by cell you can insert blank rows you can insert custom calculations in fact you don't even need to use DAX at all so with some of these custom visuals you don't need to use this metadata table because you can insert custom rows yourself so one of the ones that i used um is the uh financial reporting matrix by um uh, maybe that one. so this allows you to then insert a custom calculation so we can insert gross profit and we can say it's revenue less cost of sales and it will it will it'll do that calculation. So there's some custom visuals as well that are that are quite neat and you can do a lot of stuff for free in these. Some of them are some of them are paid for. Cool. Any other questions? I mean, I'm happy to carry on and show you guys the, the calculation group method for the month to quarter year today if you want. Up to you, Augustine, Christian. Yeah, we still have some time. So the, the okay, call is cool. until seven. Oh, brilliant. Okay, great. So I, I think it was an hour. Is it is an hour and a half? Um, yeah, we always uh, plan in uh, an hour and a half. Um, sorry, so that's sometimes that's we right. end a little earlier. Yeah. Right, brilliant. Okay, great. Sorry, I jumped the gun there then. So I can show you. <laughs> I've got a few more things I can show you then in that case. Okay, so one of the things I was saying we wanted to do, um, and especially if we have a kind of um, single selection on here uh, for month right so now we're showing data for each month and we're showing the actuals and the actuals prior year but what's really useful especially from a kind of finance view is to say actually we want to be able to show month to, either month to date numbers quarter to date numbers or year to date numbers and um, as I said one way to do that is enter data and then to use switch in the same way we did here 
essentially to say if you've got month to date selected and they have, you have single selection on that slice as well and the month to date, quarter to date, year to date. If you've got month to date selected, do this. If you've got quarter to date, do this. If you've got year to date, do this. Um, what I'm going to do is do it as a calculation group instead. Um, just because I think it's 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 a nice neat approach. Now, I think you want to be careful how you use calculation groups because if you have multiple of them running at the same time on your report, it can uh, it can create some un unwanted results because you have to be really careful of the precedence in which they run and, and things like that. And it, you can start to um, sorry, I've lost my license key for that. Let me just open up Tableau Editor two. Okay. So in here now, we've got then our, our finance data and we've got a, a, an error there because I just created that random measure, but that's fine. OK, so now what we can do is we want to have month to date, quarter to date, year to date. And as I say, creating a calculation group actually creates a table for you, like a disconnected table that you can have or it could be connected um, in, in the same way as enter data, but it attaches a calculation to each row of that table, essentially to each item in that table. So if we now then um, create a calculation group, so if we do new calculation group, and I'm just going to give it this name, um, calculation group, um, and um, just, sorry, just bear me one second. See, uh, let's call it periods. And here we've got calculation items, so now we can create a new calculation item, and we can call it month to date. Um, now, what we could do here, so say we wanted to create, actually, we don't need to do month to date anyway because it's actually monthly data anyway, but let's let's ignore that for the minute. Let me just delete that measure for a second. No, Tableau Edit is going to complain. Um, if we wanted to do a measure that would say month to date, quarter to date, we could do this. We could say total actuals month to date. And we could do calculate total actuals and do dates MTD and you can do the states QTD, dates YTD. And then again, because it's a, a time intelligence function, all we need to pass into here is our date field. And that's great. But the challenge is we're doing it this approach is that we would then have to we'd have to do it on the base measure for a start. Otherwise, you know, you're going to have to start going in and creating budget version um, month state, quarter state, year to date, and creating all these other versions of month state, quarter state, year to date. And as I say, we can get around that by using by using it as a, as a new base measure by creating essentially total amount by period, or total income statement amount by period, and then you know basing everything like actuals and stuff on top of that. But but generally, you want to avoid um, you know doing this. So what we can do is we can take that example, just check it works for actuals, check it gives us the right answers. And then in the calculation items, um, ah, sorry, I knew I'd, I need to, I need to have the editor's going to do that. Let me just create that again, sorry. And then um, calculation items, month to date. So now in here, we can essentially cre create that, but now replace total actuals and say, actually, I want to apply it to whatever measure we're looking at whether that's actuals, actuals prior year, actuals um, budget value, whatever it is that we've got, say, on our income statement, we want to look at it on a month to date basis. So for something like this, calculation groups make a lot, a lot of sense because what we can do is replace total actuals here now with selected measure. So this is a, a, a function that's used for in calculation groups. Measure, dates month to date, date. And um, we can give that an ordinal value as well. That's just the order in which it appears. And now we can duplicate, and we'll call this quarter to date, and duplicate, and call it. Yes. And here we can go in and just change the calculation to say dates from dates MTD to dates QTD, and here from dates MTD. Great. So now we save this back to our model. And if we open this back up, we've now got in here um, CG periods. Just need to refresh. Um, we, we should have called it periods rather than name, but that's fine. 
Um, and if we now look, it's created a table for us, essentially, that's got month to date, quarter to date, year to date. And this ordinal number is the order. So actually, maybe we wanted MTD to appear first, so maybe we should have given it um, a, diff a lower ordinal number. But that's fine. We can drag on to here. Uh, and um, we can make this now look like put it to a slicer. And if we go into here, let's just make this look a little bit more like a, a button. Um, and let me just give it a slicer header. So now, and actually, as I say, I think we definitely want single selection on here because you want to make sure something's selected. You're either showing monthly, quarterly, or year to date numbers. Um, so now let's see February. Yep, if we do quarter to date and year to date, yep, uh, in February, that's the same time. And my dates have gone completely wrong now. Uh, I, I did something to the thought, say, uh, sort order. Let me just fix that back again. Um, is it because I applied the sort column on here? Uh, month number. i just sort month by month number. And then hopefully, yeah, okay, that's fixed up. So now we're looking at April. So we've got month to date, quarter to date. Uh, yep, it's the first, it's the first month of the quarter. That makes sense. And then year to date numbers. Um, and if we do May, which is now the second one, we should see it's a separate number for month to date. And then that's uh, April, uh, March and April. So April and May, sorry. And then um, that's January, February, March, April, May. Now it's our numbers. So that's that's a, that's a nice little trick we can do and just say that's we could have done it by switch, but I like the calculation approach for, for something like that. Any questions on that? Cool. OK, um, so the next thing I kind of wanted to show then as well is um, just some ideas about what we could do around um, show it, telling a story with the data. So let me. Um, let me open it up and we can we can start to look at some of the visuals. So I, I did this report years ago and I did publish it to um, the data stories gallery and I'm hoping it's still there because I can just build up um, that one there. So it's not it's not the best design. I think my design skills have improved hopefully a little bit in the, the time since I built this. But um, essentially what I wanted to highlight here is how we can use some of the kind of cross filtering and some of the other things we can do with with showing um, some visuals of other data. So we've got um, at the top, we've got our, our key metrics. Now, by default, if you just have a card visual and it shows 1.5 million, 755k for a given month and again we've got our month to date quarter to date year to date here that's fine but actually it doesn't really mean anything right what does 1.54 is, is 1.5 million revenue good or bad well for microsoft it's good for me if i'm running my own little business that's that's pretty good so for microsoft it's bad if it's me running my own business that's that's probably pretty good so really what you need is context for that number um and you know I think they are making some changes to card visuals, hopefully to to do stuff like this. But you know, the idea is that you want you want to be able to provide some context as well. So what I added here is just uh, an an icon, just SVG icon that it look, compares it to prior year. So now we've got a prior year number here, and then we've got the change, the variance to prior year number here, and just also then just an icon, and it's just it's either an up arrow or a down arrow, and it's conditionally formatted as either red or green, depending on whether that's a favourable or unfavourable um, change. So um, not necessarily up or down. Obviously, if revenue goes up, that's favourable. If your costs go down, then then that's favourable. Um, so then we've got you know we've we've got card visuals, and that's good. But I think it's really important to add some context to those. Um, we've then got our income statement, and this is the same same data. Um, we've got actuals, budget, uh, actual budget variance, and then the percentage. And we've applied some conditional formatting on here. So this is, we've got a few different formats of that income statement. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, did it actually, did it? Sorry about that. Uh, 
that kind of exposed screen. Yep. So we've got a few different um, formats of that. We've got fixed format one, which is just going to have our lines. We've also got then um, a measure comparison. So here we've got a few more columns. We've also got the plus minus icons. Again, this is what we can do on a matrix. It's more like a pivot table. So we can drill down and select, you know, drill down into that hierarchy. So headers, subheader, subheader two. So we can drill down all the way into those um, gross sales, into company sales and so on. Um, and, and drill down into that detail. Um, and we've also got then a, a version where we've got the division along the top. So we can start to see um, how that breakdown is. So again, just using bookmarks, we've got a few different versions of the income statement, depending on the kind of view people want to have. Maybe, uh, and if you looked at, you know, any annual reports, you tend to see the income statement presented in a couple of ways. Um, you don't have the interactivity. Um, we could do with the accountants enough to do a month end. They could focus on the analysis, Fernando. That's what they're paid for. They're not paid to number crunch in Excel. Um, so um, we've got we've got these, and then we've got waterfall chart. And waterfall charts is is quite favourable across accountants because it really helps you to highlight where your what what's driving your variances. Um, and you, it's typically used with balance sheet because you have your balance at the start of a period. Um, and your balance at the end, and then you can see what's made up that difference between your starting balance and your ending balance. Um, and here, um, what we've got is actually used it for actual monthly monthly snapshots as well. I mean, it, it still kind of works in the same principle because you can say uh, start of month, because I'm looking at month to date. So for April, essentially, um, yep, my, my uh, total actuals, my actual uh, net profit was 290K. And then um, in uh, May, it was a 250k loss. Uh, and that's what we can see here, 250k loss. So what's uh, that difference between those two monthly uh, net profit figures? What, how is that broken down? Um, so we can see, you know, uh, Pacific Operations had a much higher revenue this month, uh, net profit this month. And then North America had a lower one and Europe had a, a much lower one. So you actually you can see the fact that our, we've made a loss this, this month compared to, and it, you know, so different to last month, is really driven by North American European and operations doing much worse than they did last month. Now, there's two kind of variations we can put on that. We've got quarter to date, where we can actually do, now this is start of quarter and quarter to date numbers. So actually these, these labels and the, the calculations have, have updated um, to now present all right numbers and same with year to date, start of year to year to date. So, um, you know, what did you have? In, um, in January, and then what have you got? It's, it's your year-to-date numbers. So how have those years-to-date cumulative numbers broken down? We've also got the fact that these are interactive. So this is by default, just looking at net, net income. But say we wanted to do focus on revenue. Now, this waterfall chart is showing you your revenue for the month prior month and for the current month, and then the difference between those two numbers, which divisions are making that up. So say this is usually used for balances, um, but that I think that could be used in, you know, the reason I wanted to bring it out here is because it's a very powerful visual to use to present finance data and for, for good reason. Um, next page I just want to show here is a kind of um, ratio analysis. So what we've done is again using exactly the same data that we were just looking at today. We've got a few different ratios that we've calculated. So gross margin and say margin actually re relates to percentage. So I think that that headers I should probably update. That's your gross profit percentage. So your gross profit, uh, income less cost of sales over your income. Cost income ratio. So your costs divided by your income. So you can see what proportion of income have you got as costs. And this is a really key metric to track. Effective tax rate. Um, you know, it's the profit before, uh, tax over your profit before tax. Net profit over your income and sales growth. So calculated a few different measures here, just standard Power BI measures. And then just put these, created a table with these, and now we can see some kind of breakdowns. So again, we look at the ratio and we look at what it was in the last year, and we say, what's the change? So again, you've got a bit of context to there. And now we're really trying to understand what's driving that number. What's driving our cost income ratio to be 13% higher, which is not good <laughs> than it was last year. So last year, you know, our costs were only 42% of our income, and this year they're 55%. So we can now break this down and see by by different um, divisions where that cost income ratio is. And again, the key here is context. 
because we can see which ones have the highest. But again, it's also compared to prior year. So now we've got this is using a bullet chart and you could do it as two bar charts. Actually, that also kind of works. Um, we can see our, our the the black lines here is our prior year. So European operations are 64 percent, but last year is 76 percent. So actually they've they've done a lot better. Um, whereas North America operations, you know, last year they were 30, their costs were 33 percent of their income and now it's 46 percent. So we've really got that context that we can see at a, at a glance. We can really see what's driving those numbers. The other thing to bear in mind is that um, when we look at it overall, cost income ratio, it's not it's it's relative. Right. So actually, if you have a, even if you have a division here, say you had say you had North American operations that's got a really high cost income ratio, that doesn't mean that that's actually driving your overall number, because if that's a tiny proportion, if that's, you know, five percent of your business in terms of revenue, that's not what's driving the 30 percent increase in your cost income ratio. So what you really need for that, again, is context. Um, and we, so what we've done here is plotted cost income ratio in the, in the current year first over the revenue. So really what you want to look at here is ones that have got a high cost income ratio and high revenue, because these are the ones that are really driving um, your, your cost income ratio. And again, you want to keep that interactive. So, you know, you could focus on a particular division and then look at all the organisations within there and say here, you know, we can see uh, France, Germany. Maybe I'll select a different month, actually. Uh, let me select April or something. Uh, they're, they're still quite similar, aren't they? Um, yeah, we can select we can select a few different ones here and we can see where there's particular outliers. So where you've got ones that have a cost income ratio, but relative to their revenue. Um, and then we can see that kind of over time. So actually, again, we're here, we're looking at a whole year, but actually maybe that number's, you know, been quite different. Maybe there was an increase in costs in particular time periods. So then we can, again, cross highlight. So now we want to focus in on France, a hold down control. And then we can see for France, we had um, a, a large dip in the cost income ratio. Um, and we can then see the kind of income statement for here. And then we can start to understand what specific numbers are driving that. So then you can start to say, OK, actually, I want to look at um, France for March 2008. Oops, I think I just deselected that. Sorry, let's wait a second. And now we're looking at, uh, if, if I've done that correctly, we're looking at the income statement for that period. Um, and we can really see which particular costs are, are driving that. So is it, you know, compared to prior year, actually, maybe it's, we could see, you know, labour expenses um, has gone up considerably, right? So um, it was 828 over, and now it's 1.7 million. Um, and, you know, that's got a huge variance in that particular month. So, so, maybe that helps us to understand and we can tell that story about about what's going on with that. Um, so, yeah, really important, I think, to have to have some of those. Um, and I think actually what you can also do is put them as kind of bookmarks. And I don't know if I've done that in this particular version, um, but essentially like you would present it, how you typically present this is um, in PowerPoint. So again, what accountants typically do is um, is a uh, it's to, even if they're doing it in Power BI or Excel, is uh, take snapshots of the visuals, put them into PowerPoint and then put some commentary. But actually what you can do is create bookmarks so that um, you can start to tell the story, put the narrative as part of a bookmark, put some visuals, which are live visuals still, put them as part of a, uh, with some text narrative and have those as different bookmarks um, or you know, essentially different pages that you can just navigate, hidden pages that you can just navigate to that tell a story. Much better way of doing it than exporting everything to PowerPoint, creating static copies that are not linked to the data and, and all the rest of it. So uh, yeah, lots of things to think about for, for finance functions to, to be able to improve there. Um, last thing just to highlight as well, we talked about um, in Excel, you'd you'd typically have to have um, a big a big button and your, and your income statement maybe to to create all those different cuts for different divisions. Obviously in Power BI, you've got this whole concept of um, row level security. So just wait a second. Um, so in here we can go to um, create a new role. Uh, so go to manage roles create a role, say European operations. Same organizations. Add filter, organization name. I can't remember if I've done it on the right field or not, but 
get the idea, European operations. So we now have a role that will only see, that will filter the data automatically for European operations. And then once we publish this in the Power BI service, we can go in and assign people or groups to that role. So you'll have multiple people looking at the same dashboard, the same report, um, and, but they'll see different data depending on their roles because you'd have filters automatically applied. And no matter how they're, however they're viewing that data, even if they're using Excel as a front end, um, they'll, they'll still see um, uh, only the data that they're supposed to. So it gets around a lot of those challenges that you'd have with Excel when doing this kind of financial reporting. Right, so taking us right up to the time there, because you, you told me I had more time, so that's your fault. <laughs> but if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them now. I, I have one question again, Rishi. Yeah, uh, sure. Great presentation, uh, lovely stuff. Um, ju just quickly, uh, maybe you could show uh, on the plus sign where you basically do the drill through on the... Yeah, um, yeah sure. How exactly do you show it on the same, it seems the same column, but maybe you just yep. have a trick not to, to show the columns. <laughs> yep, sure. So I need to add, drag in the other fields here, actually. I haven't done that yet in here. So in uh, Dim and Counselor, we drag in subheader and subheader two. And actually, it does it by default. So by default, the plus and minus signs are on. Um, ah, it stays on the same column. Uh, I thought it would you, create a, a further column. Further yeah, down. No, no, so, okay. so, yeah, so, yeah, so our sure. hierarchy is essentially our header assignment. So our hierarchy is essentially coming from from Dim accounts here. So it's header assignment, subheader, subheader two. Um, I've, I've used header from the headers table because it's always better to use the dimension okay. table, the smaller one to filter. But essentially, it's the same same thing, um, and that's that's our hierarchy to drill down from. Um, okay. Thank you. What you, have to, what you have to bear in mind is that obviously once you have things like gross profit, custom calculation rows in here, it will show those pluses. And they won't go anywhere. So it's a little bit messy. It's called a ragged hierarchy, but you, there's ways to deal with that as well. Ah, OK, OK, OK. OK, great. Thank you. <laughs> I'll have to dig on that one. Sure. Have any of you kind of worked with finance data, tried to do some of this financial reporting yourself, build any statements, anything like that? I, I try to do it, but <laughs> it, yeah. it's not, it's not a, a, as advanced as yours right now, <laughs> I can say. You, you need to see the the, the complex data that, <laughs> that we've been working off in PPS. I'm sure Fernando, okay, Fernando yeah. will tell you about it at some point. Show up again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Okay. Um... I don't think there is anything else. So, wait, oh, if it's there's another easier, question coming up. It's easier when deploying the same model from the enterprise data warehouse. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know that's 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 a good solution. Um, what I tend to do, and we've done this with a complex data set example, is is apply things like incremental refresh and use it through data flows. Um, you know, I like this idea of having data flows as an abstraction layer in between your data source and um, the reporting layer, or your, even your data set, because the idea is that, you know, what you don't necessarily want to do is one thing to have low level security in a data model, but the other thing, oh yeah, Sarah's, Sarah's using, using SAP Analytics Cloud, and actually we're, I don't know if you guys are part of London Business Analytics Group, um, but there's a, uh, we're doing a session with Sarah, hopefully next month, maybe. Um, I, I, maybe Sarah, if you could put a link in the chat, if you get a chance, um, I'll put the name in the chat. Um, it's, it's 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 a quite a vibrant community that I've taken over from from uh, one of my friends, Mark Wilcock, for a little while. Um, we're we're going to show some examples of using actually SAP Analytics Cloud and and connecting that. But generally, so what I said about data flows, the reason I really like data flows, and this is essentially Power Query, it's the same the same engine, but it runs in the Power BI service. Um, what that allows you to do, especially if you create um, data flows within your own um, environment, um, is that you can then go in and, um, sorry, in your own workspace, you can then assign, you, you can bring in the data, you can create a centralized connection to your enterprise data warehouse. And if you've got premium, you can set up incremental refresh on there. So it doesn't bring in all the data every day, it just brings in the new records or records that have changed. Um, and then what we could do is, um, essentially 
create a data flow here, connect to it. And then if you have a workspace with just your data flows, you can control who has access to that data, who can who can who can connect to it by just setting it as um, workspace access. So we can create AD groups or we can um, and then give them access to those data flows. So that kind of architecture I, I really like for connecting to to enterprise systems. Um, but yes, once you bring it into Power BI, once it's in the query editor, it's exactly the same as anything else, whether it's coming from Excel files, whether it's coming from EDW, uh, and typically it'll be the data that's coming from transactional EDWs, identity data warehouses, it's going to be a little bit more split out. So typically what we do for BI reporting is bring stuff together. So for example, uh, you know, if you had customers on here, for example, you might split it all out into separate tables um, and you want to bring it together. Um, you know, rather than having customer address and then customer address line in a separate table, or you know, you might want to put it together. Same with accounts. Maybe you have um, account keys, and then you have all your account types in a different table. Um, and even though you've got repetition here, um, it's 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 better. It's better to have this as one table rather than creating that kind of multiple joints in Power BI. The repetition is not a problem in Power BI. It's 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 better to have that repetition than it is to have scattered scattered tables. So I don't know if that actually answered your question, but it was a bit of a bit of a waffle on on uh, on using enterprise data warehouses. So you can, I have a question. So for all this kind of data stored in the Excel file, so is that the manual login in that kind of file, or that file pull out from other softwares? So the files, sorry, are you talking about these files? These CSV yes, files? all the original files, so all the Power Query original queries. So from the Excel, is that a manual login or the from from other from other software you dump to there? So this, I mean, yeah, there's there's a few. Obviously, there's lots of different approaches, right? So um, you know, once you once you go into here, you can connect to anything, right? So um, if it's if it's Excel files, so if I create a new data flow. And I've logged in using the wrong um, account, I think. So uh, let me just go to a non a non premium one because I think I've logged in with that. Yep. So I'm going to here new data flow. It's the same as same as as Power Query. Here you can choose where you want to bring your data in from. So in our example, we brought data in. We had CSV files stored on SharePoint. So for example, you could have um, you know, uh, data coming in from, you know, a Power Automate flow that takes your extracts and puts it into a SharePoint folder or puts it into, you know, OneDrive, whatever it is, um, and then pick it up using SharePoint. And then, you know, you can connect to that here as a data flow, as a cloud data source in data flow, and it will put it in. Equally, you can connect to Azure SQL database, you can connect to blob storage, uh, Synapse Analytics, you can connect to lots of different things here to be able to bring in your data. Um, so it, it's exactly like the connectors in Power BI Desktop, but it's limited to cloud sources, um, really, from here, uh, unless you unless you want to go down the gateway route. And um, yeah, that's uh, that. This this is a this is a better way of doing it. So I'm not sure I'm not sure I answered your question there with that. Sorry. So yeah, so my uh, the the reason I ask that question because uh, sometimes we know we have the front end uh, like Excel file. The people can like log in the number, for example, or these people get the weekly number. Then the people log in in front of Excel. So at this kind of point, normally in business case, we can see some kind of the human errors will happen. So mm. if we 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 want to have some kind of the checker, then we can check that data integrated be, before we we get that data into our data flow and into our our Power BI query. So I want to see what kind. How do you uh, how do you handle this kind of the issue in the reality? Yeah. So I mean, it's the same way as you do it if you're connected to a Power BI. I mean, that's a really good point. It's it's a, you know if you were connecting to files that people had done manual data entry into, you definitely want to do some data checking. Um, and you can do things like um, let me just uh, let me just show it here. You could do um, I forgot completely what that. It's just escaped to me what it is. But essentially, you can do. Um, Table dot uh, sort of would help me. What is it called again for the statistics? Um, statistics or uh, there's there's a, there's one you could do where you can actually just pull out all of the kind of statistics of the things. So you could look at max min values, how many blanks you've got, things like that, and that will that will be a data set that you can then kind of look at as a data quality um, uh, piece. The other thing you can do is um, you can you know do things like. Uh, 
remove errors or, uh, in your in your real data, then have a separate table where it says keep errors. And then you can go into the, you could look at, you know, reporting on your on your errors. I mean, data quality is a whole kind of piece in itself. Um, I'd, I'd have a look at some stuff of Imke Feldman um, and, and she's done some some kind of reporting on that. And, and also Gil Raviv looked at how you can create snapshots and then compare those snapshots over time to see what's changed, which which might also be something you build into data quality rules. Um, you, you're right. I mean, it is, a, it is a challenge and it's not it's not the easiest one to solve. Um, but there are some things you can do with with this kind of power query to, to be able to pick out where you've got erroneous data. Um, I see, I see. Yeah, so, so sometimes the, 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 this kind of like the power query also broken because that very happen very often. Once the structure changes, the power query kind of recognize all this kind of the advanced edit, all this will gone. So this that will have the errors come out. So did you see that any kind of this kind of the, uh, happened in your model? Like uh, the, sometimes the power, this kind of the query doesn't work in power query, then, then you just uh, get that kind of the warning on the Power BI service. Yeah, so actually Power Query is quite fickle um, by default um, in the sense of if something changes and, you know, say you put a string into a numerical data type, it will it will throw an error and it will just, it, it will give you an error when refreshing the data set. Um, and, and actually sometimes you want to avoid that and just capture it separately, which is kind of some of the techniques I'm talking about now. Um, but by default, you know, Power Query wants stuff to be in the right format. It wants the columns to be the same as it was last time. It wants the data types to be the same, all of that. And if, if stuff starts changing, it will just break, um, which is which is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it, <laughs> depending on the case. So, yeah. yeah. Good. Table dot schema. OK, actually, I've not used that one, actually. I, I've, I Table profile was one I was thinking of, this one. Um, where it gives you, uh, you can reference a query and then say it'll give you statistics on it, min, max, average, standard deviation, count, null count, distinct counts. Yep, definitely subscribe to that YouTube channel. There's some really great sessions um, on this, actually. I have subscribed, but I'm not going to different user. Excuse me, can you also post the, the link of your Power BI post in the Power BI gallery, the, the, the report, and we can quickly check? Yeah, uh, yep, sure. I mean, this is, I, I'm not, I'm not massively proud of design of this, to be honest, but yeah, that's fine. Um, I will paste it in there and then, um, yeah, there's, as I say, I'm, I'm building a lot of the material around it. I've got, I think in the link to here, actually, I've got a link to to a series of blog posts that describe a lot of what we've covered today, actually, um, in, in terms of how to build it out. And I think it's referenced in here. There was an AKMS link that's broken. Um, I think I'll put it here. So, yeah, yeah. Again, I, I did this a few years ago now. Um, it talks about how to build out th that page. So, connecting to data like we did today, connecting to CSVs, creating the base measures, uh, creating advanced measures. I didn't use calculation groups because it wasn't even out at that time. Um, KPI cards and waterfall charts, how to create some of these, and creation of a fixed format income statement with running total measures and things like that. So, yeah, feel free to feel free to check out these. And I'm putting this content into the format I was showing at the beginning, actually, um, along with the example we're working off in, in Power Platform Finance. So there is more material coming on this stuff because I, I appreciate it's it's not the most obvious stuff to do. Um, and yeah, it's you know, I think there's it, it deserves it deserves quite a lot of uh, uh, content in its own right. OK. If um, there isn't any more questions, uh, I'll quickly share my screen again um, for the links to the YouTube channel and the meetup. I hope you can see it. Yeah. So um, Augustine already put it in the chat. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, uh, you should uh, definitely just subscribe after today. Uh, and uh, thanks a lot, uh, Rishi, for this uh, super interesting session. Uh, probably gonna rewatch the video as well uh, to actually grab everything uh, that you just uh, shared with us. Um, thanks a lot. Um,
And uh, with this, uh, just a, a last reminder to um, the upcoming session. Uh, just give me a second. Oh. No. My presentation broke. So um, the, the next session is going to be um, actually next week. Um, so next Wednesday again, and uh, it will be R Romano with a Power BI API extravaganza. So uh, don't miss out on that. And again, thank, uh, thank you a lot, Rishi, for taking the time. Thanks, everybody, for connecting. Um, really appreciate that. Thanks, Rishi. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you. All. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Bye. You. Bye.